Okay, let's get into our third sub subtopic of the motion, forces, energy and momentum topic, and that is energy. So we're going to start our look at energy by looking at the concept of work. I always wonder whether we probably should explain to students what work is before they get to the second semester of year 11 when they're doing physics. Um, maybe they need to learn what work is a little bit earlier in their school career. But jokes aside, just before we talk about work, I have structured slightly differently what I'm doing over here on the left hand side. So this is the information that the SACE board says that we need to know. Now the way that start the, the way that is is structured is that the top part is generally the um, or the part that's in like a paragraph format, um, often at, normally at the top, is describes the, the content that needs to be covered. That is, if you like, our learning intention for this topic. This is the content that we need. In green, the dot points, which always generally start with a verb, describe the skills that you have to display or the, the things that you need to be able to do to show your understanding of the content. So these, if you like, are your success criteria. If you can do these things, do these success, do these success criteria that is showing you have an understanding of the content that it is described above, which is our learning intention. Okay, let's talk about work and what work is. Whenever a force moves something, work is done. When you push or pull on something, and it does not move, you are, not a, you are just applying a force, you are not doing work. When you push or pull on something and it moves, you are doing work. The units of work are joules, which is the same as the unit for energy, and you'll see why that is in a minute. Work can be calculated using the equation work done, W equals force, F times distance, D, or I think in the book they might use displacement here. Um, you can use either distance and displacement. You probably know by now, often interchangeably. Strictly speaking, work is not a vector quantity. Distance is not a vector quantity. So it doesn't have to be displacement. But either you'll see sometimes S for displacement or D for distance there. Don't stress too much about that. So that's just explained there. So let's just have a look at a couple of really simple questions around this. How much work is, so I'm just up here, how much work is done pushing a book a distance of 60 centimetres if the force that must be applied to overcome friction is 4 newtons? So the distance equals 60 centimetres equals 0 0.60 metres, convert to SI units. The force is equal to 4 newtons, two significant figures again. Um, how do we work out the work done? Well, work done equals force times distance, which is equal to, we substitute in, 0 0.6 times by 4. Which... If the mass that I'm doing in my head is correct, is 2.4 joules. And we had two significant figures in our thing, so we've got two significant figures here in our answer. So, very simple. Um, very simple calculation to work out work done. Um, just before we talk about energy, another classic sort of thing to think about with these um, questions about um, work done is identifying which of the following situations work is being done. A weightlifter lifting a weight bar from the ground to above their head. Are they applying a force? Yep, they're pulling it up and then pushing it up. Is the bar moving? Yes, so 
force applied, something is moving, so we would say, yes, work is being done. A weightlifter holding a bar, weight bar above his head. Well, if they're just holding it above their head, if it's already up there, they're not moving it, they're just holding it, so we would say, no, work is not being done. A car being held stationary by its brakes on a hill. And sorry, I just realised there's a typo there. That should say brakes with a wrong spelling, wrong brakes. Um, in this case, the brakes are applying a force to the wheel. They're locking onto the calipers, but the car's not moving. It's not causing the car to, to move in any way. So no, we would say no work is being done. A car's engine causing a car to accelerate. So the engine pushes on the gearbox, which pushes on the drive shaft, which pushes on the wheels, which causes the car to move. So yes, work is being done. Water flowing down a waterfall. Gravity is the force acting on the water and the water is moving. So yes, work is being done. A stretched rubber band holding a rolled newspaper together. I don't think anyone buys newspapers together. This question's probably a bit old hat. But a, a rubber band can store energy. We'll talk about more of that later on. But in this case, if it's holding it, it's not causing it to move. There's no movement. It's applying a force, in a force that's basically wrapped around pulling the newspaper in, but it's not causing it to move. So no, we would say no force is being applied. Um, you probably, I talked about this with, um, with force in an earlier lesson. Um, it's probably another one to think about here. Um, and you'll see why I want to talk about this in a minute. How much work is done in lifting a hundred gram mass one meter? So we're looking at this question here. Um, probably, I know, almost a little bit obvious, but let's have a look at it anyway. Um, just find a pen. So... Firstly, the mass is equal to 100 grams. Let's convert that into our standard unit, which is kilograms. The height or the displacement or the distance that it's going to be moving is one metre. And you might be looking at that going, well, we know a mass and distance, but we don't know force so how can we work out the work done the work done is our unknown so we have to do this one in two steps firstly though we do know that the acceleration of the object or the acceleration due to gravity let's go back a step we know that the force acting on the mass when we lift it is gravity and the acceleration due to gravity is 9.8 meters per second per second and we can now work out the force, which is what we talked about before. The force of that mass due to gravity would be equal to its mass times acceleration, which would be equal to 0.1 times 9.8, which would equal 0.98 newtons. So just under one newton. So you can think about a 100 gram mass sitting in your hand is about one newton of force. I think I mentioned that in an earlier lesson. Now that we know the force and we know the distance, we can work out the work done. So work done is equal to force times distance, and that is equal to 0.98 times by 1.0 meters. That is equal to 0.98 joules. So if you want to picture Roughly what one joule of work does looks like grab a hundred gram or grab two fifty gram masses or a hundred gram mass object, lift it up one meter. That is one joule of energy. If you drink a can of coke, if you look on a can of coke, I think it contains about six hundred kilojoules of energy. So we'll get to this in a sec, but that's telling you drink a can of coke and you should be able to lift up that weight about 600,000 times. Now, it's not quite so simple as that, but that sort of just gives a bit of an idea. So, before you sort of jumped ahead to this, what is energy? Energy is the capacity to do work. When work is done on an object, it gains energy. 
So if, say, I push an object, it gains speed, it'll gain what we call kinetic energy. We'll talk about that again in the slide soon, but I think you guys have probably heard of kinetic energy before. When an object does work, it loses energy. So when the brakes on your car do work, then your car loses kinetic energy. And the work done equals the energy lost or gained. So if the object does work, it equals the energy lost. If work is done on the object, it equals the energy gained. So if I throw a ball, I apply a force, cause it to move a distance, I've done work. If I catch a ball, I apply a force to that ball, cause it to slow down, it loses energy, that energy is lost, that energy in a sense could be transferred to my hand, but, but we'll get more into energy transfers and conservation of energy as we go forward. But it's, energy is the capacity to do work. Work and energy are essentially the, in a sense, the same thing, but I guess they're slightly different, but, but they're very inherently related to each other. So there is our introduction to work and energy. Let's continue. So what we need to do, the concept, if you like, the, the topic, energy exists in a number of different forms. So our learning intention is to learn about different forms of energy. How will we know we've done that? What will our success criteria be? We can describe different forms of energy, including kinetic, elastic, gravitational, potential, rotational, kinetic, heat, and electrical. And we'll get into looking at that now. So generally, I would classify energy into two types, potential energy, and then there are different types of potential energy that we will look at, and kinetic energy, and there are different types of kinetic energy that we will look at. So potential energy is stored energy. It is the energy an object has because of its position or structure. So some examples, elastic potential. That's the energy stored in a stretched or a compressed spring for that matter. Or a rubber band. We know if we stretch a rubber band out, it's elastic. If we let it go, there is basically energy stored there. Um, that has the ability to apply a force um, to cause something to move, i.e. the rubber band to fly across the room. We have chemical potential energy. That's the energy stored in chemical bonds um, of a fuel. And when we say fuel, that could be like your fuel in a car, but it could be the carbohydrates or the fats that you eat to fuel your body. Or it could be a battery in the case of an electric guitar or a mobile phone or any sort of electrical device there. Um, well, not any electrical device, any battery-powered device, we should say. So chemical potential is energy stored in chemical bonds. We also have gravitational potential energy. This is quite an important one. We need to do a little bit more detail on. That's the energy stored in an object due to its position above the ground. So if I hang on to something, can I hold it two metres off the ground? If I let it go, obviously gravity will apply a force to it. It will cause it to move, it'll move a distance. Basically, work is being done. Um, that amount of energy that it has stored because of its height above the ground is called the gravitational potential energy, or EP is the symbol we use sometimes there. And that can be calculated from mass times gravity times height. So remember here, what this is essentially saying is, well, that's mass times acceleration, so that's force times distance. So it's really the same as that formula. Um, and I think you'll know by now, mass in kilograms, acceleration due to gravity is 9.8 metres per second per second. H there stands for the height. So you may need to work out, or you will at some point need to work out the gravitational potential energy of an object because of its height above the ground. So that's our main types of potential energy. Let's look now at kinetic energy. And that's the energy of an object due to its motion. So if you've ever been hit by something that you know it can apply a force, and if it's big enough, and got enough force, it can cause you to move. So it will do work on you. 
Kinetic energy, we often give the symbol EK. It's still energy, but we want to distinguish it from potential energy. Um, and some examples here, a moving car has kinetic energy. And we can work out that kinetic energy with this formula here. Kinetic energy equals a half times the mass times the velocity squared. Wind energy is a form of kinetic energy because it's the energy that the molecules in the air have because they are moving at a certain speed, i.e. the wind speed. We can also, heat is another form of kinetic energy. Hopefully somewhere in middle school, you learnt about the particle model and you learnt that as things get hotter and hotter and hotter, they vibrate faster and faster and faster. Um, so as a material gets hotter and hotter, like a piece of metal, the atoms in that metal vibrate faster and faster and faster and faster. And in a sense, the temperature of an object is just a measure of the, the average amount of kinetic energy the particles that make up that material have, i.e. how fast they're moving, how fast they're vibrating. Electricity is also a form of kinetic energy because that is the energy possessed by electrons moving in an electrical circuit. So um, wherever we have energy associated with moving objects, that is our kinetic energy. So hopefully now you have an understanding of the difference between potential and kinetic energy and you can describe some of those types, some of those different types of potential and kinetic energy like elastic potential, chemical potential, gravitational potential and different forms of kinetic energy like wind energy, heat energy and electrical energy. Let's keep moving. So now we're going to be looking at the transfer of energy. And these are the types of things that you need to be able to describe to show you understand the transfer of energy. So firstly, I think a lot of this stuff will be reasonably intuitive, but it's maybe something you haven't necessarily thought about before. So let's just think about a few energy transformation situations and think back to our last slide, our different types of energy, and think about what energy transformations maybe are occurring. So in the first one, an archer shooting an arrow with a bow and arrow. So you might, in a really simple sense here, want to think about, oh, you're pulling back the bow, you're stretching that string on the bow. So we have an example there of elastic potential energy. And that is being transferred into the arrow as it fires off. So that's being transferred into kinetic energy. So that's a, a very simple way to think about that process and, and that's fine. That's probably the main energy transformation that happened. But where does where does the elastic potential energy come from to pull back the bow? Well that could be coming from chemical energy from the food that the archer it would need to have some stored energy to pull that bow back and then we could even think over this side well that kinetic energy as that arrow goes up into the air it will be slowing down it'll be slowing down why will it be slowing down because gravity will be exerting a force on it there'll also be air resistance but we'll forget the air resistance let's just assume it's going up so as it goes up it loses speed because gravity works on it but it gains gravitational potential energy. So that's if you like when it's on its way up and then we could extend that although we're running out of room and say that when it's on its way down that gravitational potential will get converted to, oops, I'm running out of space to write there on my screen because I've got a toolbar on the side. Um, it'll get converted to 
don't know if it's going to let me move that kinetic energy so sorry you won't be able to quite see the finish of that word or that word won't quite finish but i think you get the idea so the most important energy transfer yeah it's probably the elastic potential of the bow to the kinetic of the arrow but if you think about it some deep bit deeper there is some other types of energy transfer happening there a runner racing a 100 meter sprint let's think about this example probably we are going to start off mostly we're going to have the chemical potential energy in terms of the food and that is going to get converted into the kinetic energy of the um, I probably don't need to write the, that, the kinetic energy of the runner. However, that's probably a reasonable answer, but if you wanted to think about this really deeper, where did that chemical potential energy from the food come from? Well, that actually probably originally came from photosynthesis. Where does the energy for photosynthesis come from? One here for the biologist and even the chemist a little bit. That would come from solar energy. I didn't talk about solar energy on the previous slide. Maybe it is one I should have talked about. Um, solar energy is a form of kinetic energy possessed by light. Light, we'll talk, learn a lot more about this next year, but light can be thought about as little particles. They don't have a mass, but they do have um, energy that are traveling through space um, and Basically, in the plant, the plant can absorb that energy, convert it into chemical energy um, in the form of carbohydrate or glucose, and then which gets stored as carbohydrates for energy. So, you get the idea. There's always a deeper way to think about these. Let's think now next about the battery-powered fan. So, we might start off here and think, well, battery... Batteries start off as a form of chemical potential. So chemical potential energy. And the fan is generating um, wind, which is basically a form of kinetic energy. But we actually have a few conversions there. The chemical gets converted into electrical, causes a flow of electrons. So we've got our electrical there, which is another type of kinetic. And then the electrical energy causes the fan blades to spin, which is what we would call, and again, probably, that we can think of that as like a mechanical Energy, which is just you know, an object moving has um, kinetic energy. So again, going into more detail there than maybe we needed, probably should have done those middle ones in a different colour because they're not such an important step. But we get the idea of the energy transformations that are happening. Let's go now to Mount Panorama or Bathurst. Um, and we can see here that we have... A racing car driving up the mountain what's it going to start off with well we're going to have the chemical energy chemical potential energy in the fuel and that will get converted to the kinetic energy of the car to make the car move and then as it goes up the hill it's going to be gaining gravitational potential because once it's at the top of the hill, gravity could just let it roll down on its own. So we can sort of think of that series of energy transformations there. Chemical to kinetic to gravitational potential. A tennis racket serving a tennis ball. The... The initial um, energy, and we won't, you know, again, we could go back further if we wanted, but the initial comes from 
the kinetic energy of the the racket. So the uh, how do you spell racket? I think that's right. The kinetic energy of the tennis racket. Now, as it strikes the ball, well, essentially it, it turns it into the kinetic energy of the racket, gets converted into the kinetic energy of the ball. But what actually happens if you look at that with like a high speed camera, um, you can see what happens is firstly the strings stretch backwards and the tennis ball compresses. And that is all examples of elastic potential. So as the racket hits the ball, the strings stretch back, the ball gets squashed in, and then Basically, there's all this stored elastic and then that stored elastic as that unsprings, as the ball expands out, as the strings push forward again, you get the ball accelerate. You get something, I don't, I, I know of it more from golf, I'm more familiar with golf than tennis, but they call it the smash factor. And that is the relationship between the speed that the ball comes off the club and the club, the speed the club was moving. The ball will actually, a golf ball will actually leave the club with a higher speed, particularly on a driver, than the club is moving because in that contact, basically, there is the, the, the face of the driver springs back slightly and then rebounds forward and the ball squashes and then rebounds off and that actually increases the speed of the ball above the club head speed. It's that elastic potential energy coming in. So let's talk about a photovoltaic cell, which is basically a, a solar cell. And in this case here, you would have basically solar energy to start off with, which is again, a form of kinetic energy. And that would be being converted into electrical energy which is another form of kinetic. Now, if that was being used to, say, power a battery, it might be that that electrical then gets converted into chemical. If you were um, charging up a battery, or it might get converted to... No, that's probably the most likely one you would have. Um, and a coal-fired power station. So we've gone from the green energy to the, the not-so-green energy. We start off there with having chemical potential energy um, stored in the coal. Chemical uh, potential in the coal that's basically our fuel and we know at the end of that that we get our electrical energy which goes out to the grid and electrical energy again is a form of kinetic energy but in between there well the coal gets burnt, so when it gets burnt, it produces heat energy, which is kinetic. That heat um, heats up water, water expands, and it drives a turbine. So the spinning of that turbine is basically um, mechanical. Oh, yeah, we'll say mechanical. We don't have to say mechanical, but... Mechanical kinetic, which is in the turbine. And that turbine then spins and it produces the electrical energy. We could even have more steps in that if we wanted to. But hopefully you get the idea of 
how energy is transferred from one form to another form and what are some of those different forms of energy that exist in those transformations. So moving on now to the conservation of energy. And the law of conservation of energy states energy can be transferred from one form to another but cannot be created or destroyed. Now, this applies for any energy transformation. Now, it might not always seem that, that energy is conserved. If we drop two balls on the ground and one of them's flat and one of them's pumped up, well, the one that is pumped up will probably bounce back almost to the original height. So we'll see that gravitational potential energy converted to kinetic and then as it bounces it, its kinetic comes back in the opposite way and it gains gravitational potential again however the other ball that is flat won't bounce it it won't you know lose its kinetic energy it won't regain its gravitational potential energy um, but what would happen in that case is you would see you would hear probably a louder sound you would hear that real thump so we'd get some loud some energy lost to sound energy you would also, potentially the ball would become deformed. So there would be energy that was used in changing the shape of the ball. So that energy wouldn't, it would be lost maybe as kinetic energy, but it wouldn't be lost completely as energy. So what do we need to be able to do? Energy, or well, what do we need to know about? What's our learning intention? Energy is conserved when transferred from one object to another in an isolated system. Solve problems using the conservation of energy. We're going to do that down the bottom here. Describe and explain the energy losses that occur in systems involving energy transfers. So I've just sort of hinted at that, and that relates to what we talked about. Um, uh, uh, we talked about earlier, and I think we'll go through that a little bit too in the next slide as well, if my memory serves me correct. So let's think about this roller coaster here. We've got a car that moves along. As it goes up, it gains gravitational potential energy and it gets to the top here. And at the top, let's just say it momentarily stops. Its kinetic energy is zero. So at this point, it has lots of gravitational potential energy because of its height. has no kinetic energy. And it comes flying down the ramp here. It loses gravitational potential energy as it loses height, but it gains kinetic energy. It goes through the dipper at the bottom, and as it starts going up, it starts losing kinetic energy, so it starts slowing down, but it starts gaining some more gravitational potential energy. So in this case here, it might be a bit hard to read for you guys, but the mass of the car is 1,000 kilograms, and the height of the... The height of the, um, the, the track here is 45 metres. So we know all of its gravitational potential energy here will be converted to its kinetic energy at this lowest point here. So we can actually use conservation of energy to predict what its speed would be. Now, this is assuming that it doesn't lose any energy to um, heat as it, you know, friction causing any heat as it comes down or it comes down silently so no sound energy is released, etc. But how do we go about doing this? Well, the potential energy of the car, need a pen, the potential energy of the car is given by m times g times h and we know that m here is a thousand kilograms height here is 45 meters and g is the acceleration due to gravity which is 9.8 meters per second per second then we plug that all in and we get 1,000 times by 9.8 times by 45 and that will tell us the potential energy. 
And let me just pause and calculate that. So that is equal to 44,100 joules. And often we will use kilojoules. So we would say 44.1 kilojoules of energy. Now, all of that potential energy we are assuming here will be converted to kinetic energy. So all potential energy, that's the gravitational potential, converted to kinetic energy. So that means that the kinetic energy at the bottom must also equal 44,000. And I'll go back to joules here. 44,100 joules. So now we need to get a little bit, a little bit clever with our mass. We know that EK, the kinetic energy, equals a half times by the mass, times by the velocity squared. We know the kinetic energy down here. We know the mass from earlier. That's the 1,000 kilograms. So we can actually rearrange this formula and get the velocity. So to do that, we go... Get rid of the two on the bottom. Let's use a different color. We need to get rid of the two on the bottom. So I'm going to times both sides by two. Oh, hang on. Don't do me to cancel that. Oh, yep. Times both sides by two. And then I want to get rid of the M on the bottom here. So I divide that side by M and they cancel. So I've got to divide this side by M. And then I've got V squared. So if I take the square root of both sides... That will get me back to V. So after I do all that, I get left with V. I'll just swap sides here. Equals the square root of 2 times the kinetic energy divided by the mass. And if we put that all into the formula, we get 2 times 44,100 divided by 1,000. And we're going to take the square root of all that, and we get that. Do that quickly on the calculator. So 2 times 44,100 is 88,200. Divide by 1,000, it's going to, I think, equal 88.2. And then we need to take the square root of that answer. And that will tell us that the velocity will be 9.2 four meters per second. So we have just used the conservation of energy to work out the velocity that the, the car will gain going down that track. Um, probably pushing a little bit here with the mass, but again, this is the level that we do need to be at as we head into stage two. Okay, let's continue looking at some aspects of conservation of energy, and I think we're going to look at um, looking more at those losses and how we measure those losses in terms of measuring energy efficiency. We'll do that in the next slide. So, you know, this is exactly the same as on the last slide. I'm really just continuing to talk about um, this, and we're really here particularly or with solving problems with conservation of energy but we're really looking at um, energy losses and, and how we can quantify those energy losses involved in energy transfers. So the way we do that often is energy efficiency. You might hear someone talk about the energy efficiency, say, of a new solar cell, and they might say, oh, this is now at 21%. That basically means that it's able to convert 21% of the light energy that strikes it from the sun into electrical energy which is the useful energy that it, it produces. So whenever there is an energy transfer, not all the energy is transferred as useful energy. Some is lost as sound and heat energy and other forms as well. 
For example, if a ball is dropped and bounced, it will not return to its original height. That is, it will not regain all its original potential. Some is lost as heat and sound. Um, it's a bit of a simplification there. It's not just heat and sound, but we can have other forms. So how do we quantify that? We use this energy efficiency. And the efficiency equals the useful energy divided by the total energy, and then it's a percentage, so we times it by 100 to make it a percent. So look at a couple of examples here. A remote control battery contains 100 joules of energy. The remote control car has a mass of 2 kilograms. The battery accelerates the car to 50 to 5 metres per second. Calculate the energy efficiency of the remote control car. So what's the, what's the question telling us? Well, it contains 100 joules of energy. So that's telling us that the total energy available is equal to 100 joules. That's telling us the mass is equal to 2 kilograms and the velocity is equal to 5 metres per second. And I probably should have put more significant figures here. And it's asking us to work out the energy efficiency. So that's, that's how I know. So if we look at this formula here, well, we know the use, well, we know the total energy available is 100. The useful energy, we don't know, but we know the mass and the velocity. So we can actually work out the useful, because the useful energy is how much kinetic energy did the car get. So the kinetic energy of the car is equal to a half mv squared, which is equal to a half times 2 times 5 squared, a half times 2 is 1, 5 squared is 25, so that would be 25 joules of energy. So that equates to the, the useful energy that the car obtained. And then... I'm going to run out of space a little bit here. I've sort of already done, I probably should have moved that calculation across. I haven't quite used my boxes correctly. But we can now work out the efficiency using that formula that I've got written up there. So I won't write that above. The efficiency, just go F for short, equals 25 over 100. So I'm just using that formula there, times by 100 as a percent equals 25 percent so that would be the energy efficiency of that car let's look at a bouncing ball a 0.1 kilogram ball is dropped from a height of 10 meters it bounces and returns to a height of 8 meters calculate the efficiency of the bounce so maybe this one's a bit more confusing let's draw it out we've got a ball goes down we go 10 meters bounces and it comes back up to eight meters so what was the oh sorry and it has a mass of 0 0.1 kilograms so what was the, the total energy available? Well, in a sense, the total energy available here was equal to the, the potential energy of the ball at 10 metres. And the useful energy, the amount of energy it, it ended up with that it could use, is equal to the potential energy it had afterwards, which was at 8 metres. So if you like, that was before... That was after. So, if you're really good and think logically, you can almost probably say, oh, it's 80% efficient, and that would be correct. But if you're not sure, work it out, work through it. So the potential energy at 10 metres will equal mass times g gravity times height, which would equal... Uh, 0.1 times by 9.8 times 
by 10, which would equal, if I'm correct there, 0.1 times 10 is equal to 1, so it would equal 9.8 joules. The potential energy it had afterwards, which was at 8 metres, would equal 0.1 times by 9.8, still times by 8 metres, and that would be equal to... 2.1 times 9.8 times 8, just quickly going on the calculator, that would be equal to 7.84 joules. So the efficiency will equal, if you like, the useful energy, which was the potential at 8, divided by the total available, which was the potential energy it had at 10 metres, times by 100 to make that a percentage. And that would be equal to 7.84 divided 9.8, which I'm sure is going to equal 80%. Well, I have to times it by 100. 80% efficiency. Where would have that energy that was lost gone? We would have heard a sound that some of it, there might be some heat generated through friction. If you've ever watched Hotspot, when a ball hits a bat in cricket, you see that, that energy, um, evidence of that energy. Or um, well, Snicko tells you about the energy that goes to sound. So that's some of the energy transformations that we could have also had where it was lost, if you like, to other forms. Okay, I think we have one more slide to go. Let's keep moving. So time to talk about power. This is hopefully fairly straightforward if you've got everything now, uh, you've got everything up to date. Power is defined as the rate at which work is done and is equivalent to the rate at which energy is used. So power is the rate of doing work or the rate of energy loss or energy gain, um, depending on which one you're talking about. If you're talking about energy loss, it's the rate that your fuel tank loses energy. If you're talking about your car, you're talking about the rate that your car gains kinetic energy. Um, we're not going to worry about the second formula here. Uh, so anything that's per rate, you know, velocity is the rate of change of position. Acceleration is the rate of change of velocity. Anything that is a rate has time on the bottom. We're dividing by time. It's the rate of doing work. So power is equal to work done divided by time. You need to be able to solve problems and interpret problems with this. So... Power is the rate of doing work or the rate of energy change. Power is measured in watts. One kilowatt is 1,000 watts. And you may also be familiar with the horsepower. The horsepower is e one horsepower is equal to 750 watts. So a um, couple, couple of different calculations. Oh, no, just one calculation just to demonstrate this or one question two parts. What we have here is a thousand kilogram car, typical mass for a car, accelerates to 30 meters per second, it's just over 100 kilometers an hour, in five seconds. Calculate the kinetic energy of the car. Well, mass equals a thousand kilograms, velocity equals 30 meters per second, Time equals five seconds. And we want to, in this case, calculate the kinetic energy. It's our unknown. So what's our formula for kinetic energy? Half mv squared. We don't need to use the time for this part, but we may need that later. Plug that all in. Ek equals a half times by a thousand times by 30 squared and that will be equal to half times 1000 times 30 squared that will be equal to 450,000 joules or 450 kilojoules we would usually use kilojoules if we were talking about that larger number or if we're talking about the energy of a car we'd be talking about kilojoules or kilowatts so calculate the power of the car 
Well, that's the amount of energy that the car gained. So that was the amount of work that was done on the car. Power is equal to work done on time. Oh, that I should have written in that box there. That's my equation. We now know the, the work or well, the work done is equal to the kinetic energy from above, which is equal to 450 kilojoules. So we plug that all in. Power equals 450 divided by time, which was five seconds, which equals 450 divided by five, I believe is equal to 90. Five nines are 45, 90 kilowatts, which is a typical sort of power that you might expect for a car. So that is how we work out power. I probably should have thrown a question in there, given the power of a car, how much will it, how fast can it accelerate? But we'll leave that for when you do some questions. I'm not even sure if there's a question on that in the book, but it is a good question for all the rev heads out there. But that is it for energy and I guess particularly work energy and power um, time to do some questions